Shabbat Shalom, everyone. We're gathered together today on the 14th of the sixth month. I'm pretty sure I've been saying that wrong for the last few weeks, and I apologize, but I was corrected this week when I was trying to get the right dates for the upcoming festivals for my wife and family to take them off. So um, I'm glad I got back on track with that. It is the 27th on the Gregorian calendar as well. 2022 and we're taking a little segue from the book of gad the seer to cover a topic that came up uh, there's a few things that are written about this in detail and it's even mentioned in gad the seer if you recall chapter one has mention of the the song of the lamb which also happens to be related to the song of moshe and we already covered that, so there's no reason to go into it again. But just for a recap, it, it was about the horse, Hasus, and the rider who get cast into the Sea of Reeds. And that has to do with Mithraim and the idolatry involved with that. But again, we already covered that, so no big deal. This, however, happens to be an article by Donald Atkins. And we're going to go ahead and read that right now. All right. And this article is titled, does Baal God, or Gad, that actually should have a W in it, equal the Lord God of Christianity? And I know this is a touchy subject for some people. I don't mean for it to be insulting to anyone whatsoever. So please bear with us, and Father willing, at the end, you'll see what this is all about. This is, and it shall come to pass in that day, saith Yahuwah of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. And also I will cause the prophets and the unclean ruach, or spirit, to pass out of the land. Zechariah 13.2 And again, this is by Donald Atkins. Too many Christians... And just for context there, we'll go over it again sometime. But if you want to look at the Antichrist or Anti-Mashiach for Dummies videos by the YouTube channel, ChristmasIsALie.com, he goes into great detail about the origins of that word Christianity, Catholic, where the Trinity comes from, keeping Christmas, Easter, Lent, all of the abominations that desolate the inner being or the dwelling place of Elohim, which is in man, right? So he goes over all that stuff and the reason why we don't use this word in particular for believers today. I'm just going to read the article for continuity's sake, however, and because it's talking to wayward children. It says, to many Christians, the above question would be blasphemous even to contemplate. They would never even consider the thought, much less study like a noble, like the noble Brians, of whom it is written in the scriptures. Now these were more noble than those of Thessalonica, who received the word with great eagerness and searched the scriptures daily, if these were so. Acts 17.11 The scripture says that the old serpent called the devil and Satan has deceived the whole world. And the great dragon was thrown out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who leads all the world astray. Revelation 12, 9. Do you realize how deep that deception is? This article will reveal some of the depths of that deception to those who are able to receive it. Does it not behoove us, therefore, to study the scriptures in order to see if we, too, have been led astray? More so in light of the following scripture, which explicitly tells us that deliverance comes in only one exclusive name. And there is no deliverance in anyone else, for there is no other name under the Shemaim given among men by which we need or must be delivered, Acts 4.12.
Is it not evident then, according to the above quoted verse, that if Satan wants to keep us from being delivered, or you know, saved or delivered, all he has to do is to deceive us into calling on another name rather than the one exclusive name that has been given for that very purpose by our Creator. I am always shocked and amazed at the ignorance of the Creator's professed people, who cannot comprehend the simple fact that one is one and never two, three, four, five, etc. Now surely, if there is only one name given, how can these professed believers say that it doesn't matter what name they call on? Are they not deceived by that old serpent, Satan the devil, if they are calling on any other name other than that one exclusive name that was given by our Creator himself? Surely you can see that the only answer to our questions is yes, they have most definitely been deceived. Who or what is Baal? To find the answer to this question, a good place to begin is using the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary. This would be H number 1167 or 1167, Baal or Baal from 1166, a master, hence a husband or figuratively owner often used with another noun in modification of this latter sense. It's also in addition to, or in conjunction with, archer, babbler, bird, captain, chief man, confederate, meaning lord chief man, lord captain, lord of the birds, lord of the babblers, lord of the archers, the master of them. Okay, it's a title right there. All right, plus have to do, added to dreamer, to those to whom it is due, furious, those that are given to it, or great. It's added to Harry, or he that hath it. It's added to horseman, husband, lord, man. And it's added to married, master, person, and sworn, or they of. Meaning the master of those that are sworn. Okay, it's always in conjunction with these words as a title of the one of them. Now, if these were the only uses of the word Baal, we really couldn't complain, could we? Why? Because even the scripture reveals that Yahuwah was a husband to Yisrael. Now, a husband, not a title that he wanted us to call him, but he was the husband or Baal to Yisrael. And you can see that in Yeshiyahu 54.5 and Yeremiyahu 31.32. So this is, or this in Hebrew would be, Yahuwah is Baal to Yisrael. Thus Baal is used in a good sense. But this is not the only usage of the word as we shall show. Number 1168, Baal is the same or the same as 1167 baal a phoenician deity baal plural is baalim baalim right here we find another baal a bad one a false deity and for anyone who is not familiar the phoenicians are paganized hebrews they left before the exodus of moshe they were so they were attached, or they were Hebrews that went with the sons of Zerah as they were going and making city states and founding different places outside of Mitzrayim. Mehol, the son of Ethan, the son of Zerah, had Heman, Calcol, Darda, and some others. They founded different city states in Greece, including Troy, Athens, Attica, eventually the Lacedaemonians that came, and the Spartans were all Hebrew city-states and kingdoms that were founded by Hebrews mixing with the sons of Yepheth, or Yahweh specifically, to make the Greek people. The uh, son of Mehol, Mehol himself, 
in Mitzrayim was known as Phenicia Farsa. He went into Babylon, traveled around, showing the colleges or the mystery religions to these peoples as he traveled, and he founded a city that he gave. Uh -huh. He founded a city that he gave to He-Man, his son, and it was called Phoenicia, that whole area. But they had gone into the mystery religions from Babylon. Uh, I don't know all the details about how it happened or and every nuance, so I can't say, quote me on any of the details of that particular thing, but the facts remain true, that they were paganized Hebrews, the language was almost the same, but it had an extra character, and it, there was just a little bit of a shift in how it was used. You find in the book of Yobelim and other references that the word the language of creation was Yahudith or the Hebrew language. It was predominantly, it was known throughout the world until they brought in idolatry and demon sacrifices, in which case it was perverted for some. And then at the Tower of Babel, everyone lost it. Abraham, after repenting, was given the language of creation and the books of the ancestors to transcribe and study, to which he passed this language on to his children. And you can actually see in the historical archaeological records of Hebrew that it started with an Aramaic influence that was slowly faded out of it. And that is contrary to the expectation of scholars who would think that you would find it alone and then mixing. But it follows what's in Yobelim perfectly. If you go along with that uh, 501 3 or 503 Hebrew grammar by Dr. Bill Barrick there, he covers the topic pretty well. But back on point, after the Hebrew started going perverted and sinning, the language starts changing again, both for them right here with the Phoenicians, and also after they're in the land themselves, when they're taken into captivity and as they're migrating and traveling throughout the world, the language was changed according to their ways and deeds and according to his dictates based on where they went. Sometimes it was had nothing to do with overt sin. The Caledonians had a Celtic language that was influencing the ancient Greek, Latin, and the Celtic languages throughout. It, it, there, you can see the connection. There's books written about it. So um, there, there's a lot of witnesses to confirm those things. <clears throat> Back on point, though, you can see that Baal is a Phoenician mighty one which is a paganized hebrew mighty one and as we go you'll find that this is just a name for the babylonian version of zeus which is a sun deity which is what apollyon is from revelation the very same thing all the way through but right here it says and this is the difference one name and unique for yahuwah one name and unique for yahuwah yahushua mashiach but you can call Satan 31 flavors of whatever, and anything but air, anything but the truth is serving him. So here we find another Baal, a bad one, a false deity. Can we find out more about this false deity? Yes, let me quote page 1212 in the explanatory notes of the scriptures. And the scriptures would be the ISR or the Institute for Scripture Research version, first in 1998 and then 2009 and possibly later. But it says Baal. This word, it seems, gradually became a proper noun. A similar Semitic word derives from the Aryan root Baal, which means to shine. And Aryan is a mixture of the Hebrews and Persians which what happened to the northern kingdom in dispersion we'll get over into that more later but Arya, for example was one of the names of the, the capital of the scythian city in the north and that is the uh, the lion of yaw like ariel the city of the lion of el as mentioned in the foretellers but that's where they get the word for Aryan from Arya, that city so this is a similar Semitic word derives from the Aryan root Baal, which means to shine, according to some. 
according to W.H. Rocher's well-known lexicon of mythology, Baal, Bel, Belos, which is the Babylonian name and also a name for Ham and Nimrod, where those Belos lords originated from, the embodiment of Satan's will in creation. Okay. This is was the ancestral and national deity of the Semites, and says that Baal was the founder of Babel or Babylon, according to secular history. And it was Alexander Hislop and his two Babylons that makes it clear that that Belos, who was the founder of Babylon, was Ham, and then Nimrod. The two get interchanged with each other in history because they shared titles there. And then you also have the titles of Zoraster, shared both with Ham and Mitzrayim. So you have two different Zoraster's and two different Belos in antiquity and history being spoken of, which is why we have any of the discrepancies that you see as you study or the uh, mixed stories there. But all of it ties together because one was used and the other just continued the theme. But they were the head witches or head high priests of Satan in creation at the time. Maybe that will help make sense of things. The Bishop of Rome serves that purpose today. Okay. <clears throat> but it says, he is identified with Zeus, Jupiter, Amon, Asher, and that would be the national deity hero worship they called their their patriarch after their own false mighty one asher right asher and chronos and bell murdoch all right now that chronos also ties in with the father of jupiter or um yeah and then the uh, the paganized Hebrews that mixed with the Greeks, they called Kronos was Yaakov. They mixed up these stories, and that's why the mythology of the Greeks, just like the mythology mythology of the Scandinavians later on, was a mixture of scriptural truth with nonsense from pagan from demons. Okay, but it's the same picture. That's why there's nothing new under the sun. The adversary can only steal, kill, and destroy. But it doesn't create things. Back on point, it says, Morris Jastro, or Jastro, Tro, sorry, Max Mueller and W.H. Rorscher, all three agree, Baal is the Babylonian sun deity. The Baals, or Baalim, of the nations were sun deities, and Baal worship means sun worship. Quite revealing, isn't it? Now, would Yahuwah appreciate it if we called him after the name of a false deity? A closer look, and we aren't even supposed to use the word deity or another title like Theos when in relation to the Almighty or our Mashiach. And I only know that by looking at what's called the Nomnia Sacra. Anyone can still look this up at this time, so I encourage you to do that like a good Brian. But if you look up what's called the sacred names in Latin, it will tell you that the earlier Greek manuscripts, namely from the 300s to the 1400s AD, were around the time where Rome under Constantine and Sixtus banned the, the language of Hebrew and removed it from creation, just like the scriptures. It was not anything that had the Hebrew writing was being destroyed. So to preserve the text, the people used placeholders where they would have two or three letters in the Greek with a line over it that would represent in code his name, his titles like Elohim, El, Eloa, El Shaddai, Right. And then Mashiach, man, meaning Adam, the upright pole or the stratos, the, the beam 
these were all words that were placeholders that you would not use the normal word for for whatever reason and in particular his name and titles and the word like ruach you could use spirit for satan or anything that was of the normal thing but when you were talking about the creator's spirit if you will it was always ruach they would never use another word it's the only reason why i do those things when i write it myself or when i'm speaking because I've seen that written, and that was the intention in that very use. So that's what I do. But back on point, it says, a closer look at a couple of the scriptures will answer that question easily. Let us see what the mind of Yahuwah is in regard to the above question. And in all that I have said to you, take heed and make no mention of the name of other mighty ones. Let it not be heard from your mouth. Exodus 23, 13. And make no mention of the name of, other, of their mighty ones, nor swear by them, nor serve them, nor bow down to them. Yahushua 23, 7. Yahuwah has explicitly spoken to us by the above verses of scripture and many, many more. He who swears to a mighty one other than Yahuwah is put under the ban. Or he who offers to a mighty one or prays to a mighty one other than Yahuwah is put under the ban. That, that's also there somewhere. This is not to mention the name of other mighty ones, even to the point that they not be heard coming out of their lips, of, of our lips, rather. So the answer to our question is no. Yahuwah would not be pleased if we called him by the name of any other mighty one. So Yahuwah would not be pleased if we called him Baal in the bad sense. But how is that? We can call him Baal in a good sense and be right, but yet use the same word and it be in a wrong sense, causing Yahuwah's anger to burn against us. What is the answer to this apparent contradiction of Yahuwah's word? Let's look again at Strong's 1167. Do you see the answer? It's really simple. And it says, 1167 Baal is often used with another noun in modification of this latter sense. And right here, real quick, for everybody to look at, I have the uh, I have the safari up here. 1167 is the next one over. And you can see Baal. This is with a double pathak. So Baal is how that would be pronounced, and it means lord or owner. Right here, it says often plural with suffix and singular meaning. Okay. It means of these things you're the master of, right? So, and these are the things that it's Baal, Badeith, which is the, the Lord of Confederates, or the Lord of Archers, or the Lord of Horsemen, or the Lord of Conspirators, etc., etc. That's the whole point. It's usually in conjunction, and that makes it a title. And that title is in connection with the false mighty one of the nations of those who were involved in witchcraft that Yahuwah hated, and he was going to take out of the land and consume in the fire of his wrath. All typified with Yahushua coming into the land with the children to execute his judgment, which is what was a foreshadow of what our Mashiach is going to be doing, bringing us into the land. So, back on point here. It says, but what does this mean? To find the answer, we need to research a few more scriptures that will shed much needed light on the subject. The three scriptures I want us to look at relate to a place in Syria called Baal God. And again, you'll see later that's pronounced with a G-A-W-D. 
Thus Yahushua took all this land, the mountain country, and all the south, and all the land of Goshen, and the low country, and the desert plain, and the mountains of Yisrael, and its lowlands, from Mount Halak, that goes up to Seir, which if you remember, Mount Seir is Edom, and as far as Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon, below Mount Hermon. Lebanon would be Phoenicia. Mount Hermon, if you remember, it, this is where it's just below that. Mount Hermon is where the fallen messengers made their oath and pact to defile themselves with women. And this was Yahushua 11, 16, and 17. So it says, and these are the kings of the land which Yahushua and the children of Israel smote beyond the Yarden, on the west from Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon, as far as Mount Halak that goes up to Seir, which Yahushua gave to the tribes of Israel as a possession according to their divisions. Yahushua 12 7. And the land of the Gal. Gabalites, which Gabal, Gabel, Jabel, right? That's where the city in Greek is Biblios. And while that is also a false mighty one's name, both in the Greek and the Hebrew, that word Biblios is used in scripture. It's the paper. It's also the Bible, where we, they derive the word for the Bible from, because it was the paper that was used to write scriptures and to make the books for it that came from there, just for context. And the reason why the little book that was foretold in Revelation that became the Bible was called the Bible is because that very word is used in Revelation for telling that very thing. You can find this over and over again when you start studying the stuff, like the round heads being mentioned, and it was an insult, and so on and so forth. The woman going off into the wilderness, what that entailed was literally foretold in the events that happened with America and Colombia, or that woman that was an insult by, by uh, the British. To can you continue here, sorry about that. It says, have you noticed that in each of the above quoted texts, references made to a place called Baal Gad? Just what and where was this place called Baal Gad? Let's again go to the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary for the answer. Baal Gad, Baal Gad, or God, you see, that's how it's transliterated. Baal, God, from 1168 and 1409 is Baal of fortune, or what you'd call luck. Excuse me. Baal God, a place in Syria, Baal God. And if you can see, they'll tell you once how it's supposed to be sounding and spell it differently everywhere else because the repetition, as Hitler says, if you repeat a lie long, enough times, people will believe it. Could I jump in here for a second? Certainly, brother. One of the, um, I had an extensive background in drug and drug identification. When you say Baal of fortune or luck, the uh, compulsive gambling is the most deadly of all the uh, addictions. More gambling addictions result in suicide than any other addiction. And anyone who thinks they're going to go down and plop down a dollar and win a, a hundred million, uh, they are almost worshiping that. Uh, Baal or fortune or luck. That's how you you honor him. You participate in games of chance and luck because with our father, luck has nothing to do with it. There is no luck in the creator. It's absolutely. It's all worked out. But anyway, I just thought I'd throw addictive. Uh, gambling addictions are horrible. Sorry, please go on. 
I greatly appreciate your input there. I never actually thought about that. But that is perfectly in line with what Satan's all about. And just so people think that they can get lucky or fortune by trying these things. And really, all is in the hand of Yahuwah, and he turns it as he pleases. There are certain things that make you prosperous and certain that make you abstain from prosperity and following his will is the best way to have things work out for you i've been talking to my children about that trying to be clever to do good instead of just allowing those that are clever to do evil being wiser than the children of light we should be thinking about these things with intelligence and the intention of having it for the benefit of others and ourselves but back on track here he says now that wasn't much of an answer was it we still haven't found out who or what the owl of fortune was let us dig deeper to find out the truth by looking up the reference that was given under strong's number 1409 for more light number 1409 gad god from 1464 in the sense of distributing fortune troop word games this is a phenomenon that you can find as early as greek philosophy and the times mentioned in the recognitions of clement it is a satanic contrivance that is still used today in municipal law or the statutes that run most countries of the world even the usurpation in our country right now america that is but they use tricky word games and it's literally satanic because our our yahushua mashiach is the truth and he spoke in plain language satan does otherwise but right here you get to see a little bit of it it says now that still doesn't give us much light you might say you're just giving us the runaround with word games you might say well that's exactly what satan that old deceiver wants you to think you see, he doesn't want you to be diligent seekers for truth. He doesn't want you digging up in the treasure house of the Hebrew language. Because if you do, he knows that you will find out the deceptive word games he played with on you. And if you give me just one moment. All right, Shalom again. Sorry about that. I just wanted to make a little segue. This is a facebook post from a while ago that i put together and the importance here the only reason i want to share it is because it actually has the hebrew language dictionary definitions real quick about the word or the letters gimel dalit and related letters put together so i wanted to read the power or the benefit of the hebrew language and looking into it for these very things like it is mentioning so real quick and anyone that wants the all these definitions can be found in Ernest Klein's etymological dictionary of the Hebrew language for readers of English but right here Gimel Dalit also means wormwood a false mighty one of fortune and or luck right Gimel Dalit Lamed or Gimel Dalit as your authority or your teacher or on your tongue is to twist or pleat. Gimel Dalit Mem, which Mem means with them as a suffix. Okay. So Gimel Dalit with them is to be cut off, amputate one whose hand is cut off or maimed. Gimel Dalit Ayan which is to have Gimel Dalit as what your pre it's what you perceive as your mighty one or to have your comprehension with Gimel Dalit, if you will. And that is to be cut off, to hew down, to lop off, fail, or to destroy or dehorn an animal. Gimel Dalit Pei, which is the open mouth, right? So this would be Gad Fan or where we get in English the word Godfrey, right? But gad fan is to revile blaspheme and scorn a blasphemer is a gad fan in hebrew literally to have god in your mouth 
but Gimel Dalit Reish, to have him as your head or authority, is to be fenced in, to enclose, to prick, cut, stab, fence, hedge, right? It's an enclosure or a wall. And this right here, God Riel, is literally the name of the one who led Hua astray in the garden. And you find that information in the book of Hanok with the list of messengers and what they did. So this is literally the name of Satan, the, the one who, the serpent that deceived Hua in the garden was God Riel, or the enclosure, the one who fences in and hedges in for El, as opposed to the liberty which is found in him, right? Gimel Dalit. God Riel is the name, excuse me, God Riel is the name they use in the Lord of the Rings for one of the high elves. Is it now? Wouldn't you know? Yes. Well, now you can get an idea of who that's really supposed to be representing, and maybe that'll give you a different picture about that movie there. It, although I wouldn't recommend watching that. <laughs> In think, addition, wormwood wormwood is uh, used to name is named one of the nuclear bombs that uh, when they first came out with them, wormwood. Right, just like their missions to conquer the moon was with a, the. Apollyon and Jupiter and the rockets that were called Saturn. It's not, it's not a joke. They were conquering the kingdom with sun worship. It's just in the reality of it was happening at that time, which helps you get why they were calling it those names in the 60s with what they were doing. It's literally witchcraft and they were telling the truth, but people can't see it. So um, more on that part later, though, that's for a different day. Real quick, Gimel Dalit Sheen, or Gimel Dalit as your passion or your fire, what consumes and drives you, is to heap up, pile up, compress. And then a few more verses that talk about this. It says, but you are those who forsake Yahuwah, who forget my set-apart mountain, who prepare a table for God, and who fill a drink offering for many, or fortune. And I shall allot you to the sword and let you all bow down to the slaughter because I called and you did not answer. I spoke and you did not hear and you did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I did not delight. It's Yeshayahu 65, 11 and 12. And this is Exodus twenty two twenty. It says, he who slaughters to a mighty one except to Yahuwah only is put under the ban. And if you remember, the ban is what Achan also mentioned um, later on. We'll get to that. But Achan was put under the ban when he took the idols or the contraband items that were cursed that had to be burned into his house and buried them. And he hid it and his family was aware. He and everything that he owned was destroyed. It was put under the ban or accursed and had to be taken out of creation. All the gold and all the the booty that was put under the ban was just burned nothing was kept of it so shemot exodus in all that i have said to you take heed and make no mention of the name of other mighty ones let it not be heard from your mouth exodus 23 24 through 33 you do not bow down to their mighty ones nor serve them nor do according to their works but without fail, overthrow them, and without fail, break down their pillars. And you shall serve Yahuwah your Eloah, and he shall barak your bread and your water, and I shall remove sickness from your midst. I'll be a witness to you right now. I have had food and I've been satisfied with every meal I've had, and I haven't been sick. My family has not been having the seasonal sicknesses that are normal for people for a few years now because i don't call on any other name we keep his feast we do the things that he literally said this will happen and you will have sickness removed from you you humbly do these things in obedience and truth and he will do what he said because he is trustworthy and he cannot deny himself okay 
and bread and water are it applies for literal bread and water and the, the stuff that we can't live off of without them, the spiritual bread and water. He shall barak it for you when you do these things. He says, and I shall remove sickness from your midst. None shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I shall fill the number of your days. I shall send my fear before you and cause confusion among all the people to whom you come and make all your enemies turn their backs to you. And I shall send hornets before you, which shall drive out the Huite and the Canaanite and the Hittite from before you. I shall not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become a waste and the beast of the field become too numerous for you. Little by little I shall drive them out from before you until you have increased. And you shall inherit the land, and I shall set your border from the Sea of Reeds to the Sea of the Philistines, and from the wilderness to the river. For I shall give the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and you shall drive them out before you. Do not make a covenant with them, nor with their mighty ones. Let them not dwell in your land least they make you sin against me when you serve their mighty ones, when it becomes a snare to you. So a literal fulfillment of those things is what happened with the children as we were reading. Okay. But that's the importance, like I was saying, of the treasure house of the Hebrew language. Just in the very letters and what they mean, you can derive, and that's exactly what happened to me. I was studying the dictionary. I came across those words. I looked up those letters and saw the comparison and what they meant. And instantly, these things were popping into my mind about how it related to scripture and what he said. And it was from that point forward, I never used G-O-D in relation to our creator again. It has no power. It's literally the, the title for the adversary most people don't know that and while it is not able to be known it is not held against you because nescience and ignorance are two different things and it's explained very clearly if you study the scriptures out right i'll give you the how to do it the dead sea scrolls has a part where it talks about dawid and it's in the exhortation from the damascus document when he was reigning and he was accumulating many wives it was not held against him because he did not know what the book of the law said in regard to it that the sovereign or king was not to accumulate multiple wives for himself in the exhortation it makes it clear that that book was hidden from the death of yahushua and elazar until the coming of yahu zadok who was the kohen during the reign of shalomo so while Dawid was having multiple wives, that was never held against him because it was not possible for him to know that it was prohibited. But you can see in his life the effects of that. It didn't end well for him to have multiple wives. He had problems because of it, both in his children and in his wives, which he lost. So um, there's a lot of things that are involved with that, just like the patriarchs, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. What they did not know to be sin was not held against them because they could not know at the time, but they were not left unpunished in their life for the things that were not good. You can see it in the in their life and their family interactions and all the things that play out. Okay, the same thing is true for us, but while we could not know his name, it was not held against his people. And you can find in the foretellers where it talks about how he's going to lead the blind in the way and carry the lame. That was about the Reformation, where he took these people who had a kind, loving heart, who followed him in the intentions of his will without having the truth. They were blind. They were not following the festivals. They were lame. So it was literally foretold that he would do these things for us at those times or for our forefathers. And it was literally true that his name would be taken. It was also foretold in Gad the Seer, which we've covered. And as you can see here, it was all known, it was made available, and these are the things that are being hidden and kept from the people because it keeps us enslaved or under the jurisdiction of the enemy, as you'll see. 
But it said, didn't Yahushua tell us search for truth or our search for truth would be like searching for hidden treasure? Met in Yahoo 1344. Do you find hidden treasure just lying on the top of the ground? Or do you have to take a spade or shovel and work hard digging it, digging to find it? Believe me, the answer was revealed under Strong's 1409. If you know where to find the scripture that reveals this false mighty one or deity, Baal of fortune, actually, it will be quite revealing once you see it. And we just read this, so I'll, but I'll read it again. But you are those who forsake Yahuwah, who forget my set-apart mountain, who prepare a table for God, or that troop in the KJV, and who fill a drink offering for many, or that number. And I shall allot you to the sword, and let you bow down to the slaughter, because I called and you did not answer. I spoke and you did not hear, and you did evil before my eyes and chose that in which I did not delight. And that's Yeshayahu 65.11. And again, just for a quick reference, many here, just like Nebo and Belos and these other titles, that was a title for Ham. He was one of the first magicians, and he was known as the foreteller and the numberer, which was a title that was a usurpation from uh, our creator, who was the Pelmoni, or the wonderful numberer, as mentioned in Daniel and uh, chapter 7, and the apostolic constitutions. But it says, and I shall, I already read that one, I'm sorry. If you have a KJV Bible, you will find for Gad, it says that troop, Strong's 1409. In fact, many Bibles have center or side column references that inform the readers that Gad, that troop, is a false deity. This can also be discovered by looking at Strong's number 1408. Number 1408, Gad, Gad, a various, right, of 1409. Fortune, a Babylonian deity, that troop. Here is where Satan has played word games to deceive the whole world into worshiping a false Babylonian deity of fortune. But who is really being worshipped behind the name of this ancient idol, Baal Gad? And how has Satan accomplished this so easily? word games. Remember Acts 4.12. Neither is there deliverance in any other, for there is none other name under Shemaim whereby we must be delivered. Remember that Yahushua also said, If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. Yahuchanan 5.43. Notice under Strong's number 11.67, one of the definitions of the word Baal into English is Lord. And that's another one of those I wanted to show real quick in the segue. If you look at 1167, we already covered that. It does say, oh, sorry. It does say the definition is Lord. And for another one of these, 1169, you can see right here it says Beal. But right here, it's Baal, and literally, that's a schwa, which makes the A and is as in about, and then a sere. So it literally says the A word. That would be Baal, 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 sorry, Baal, Baal as one consonant, which if you just conjoin that, it's Baal. So this is the word for Baal, which actually means lord or owner. And if you are familiar at all, all of the so-called Celtic-speaking peoples or Celtic Gaelic-speaking peoples called on Baal as their mighty one. And those were actually Baalinos, Baalinos, Baal, Bali, Mar, the sun mighty one of the Celtic mythology. For anyone who is not familiar, the Celts, the Phoenicians, the Germans, they're all paganized or they're Hebrews that had left the land and had the language changing on them. 
but you can still see that the ones that were paganized were still worshiping the same Babylonian false mighty one, Baal. And it's even in the very word how it sounds and what it means right here. So there's really no excuse for saying that the two aren't connected. You can track it all the way through history, through the sound and through the meaning up into our day for the very same people that are using it. And that's why these words are better left not spoken by us in relation to the Almighty or our Mashiach. And for another reference for the similarity between the Celtic and Germanic and the Germanic in the Hebrew, I recommend this doctrinal dissertation. There's other writings as well. But Terry Marvin Bloodgett did an excellent job here of showing the Germanic languages coming directly from the Hebrew. And if you're familiar, the Germans and the Celts worshipped Jesus, which is the horse from Hebrew and where we get the false name for our Mashiach today. That's for another time. But that's the horse and the rider, which is again spoken of in Exodus 16 with the song of Moshe. Or I'm sorry, uh, not 16. Yes, it is 16. My apologies. And also in the book of Gad this year, chapter one, with the song of the Lamb. All of these tying together for this very same thing and the purposes of today, his Ruach being uh, enabling us to know these things is so that we turn from using these false names and come back to the truth because it's the pure, not the impure that has a place with him, as it's also mentioned in that first book. But back on point, we'll continue finishing this up real quick. It says right here, Baal Zebub or Baal Zebul. Number eleven six or number eleven seventy six rather. Baal Zebub, Baal Zeub, right from eleven sixty eight and twenty seventy, Baal of the fly, Baal Zebub a special deity of the Akronites. And Ekron was one of the friends of Abraham back in the day, if you remember. Baal is above. Remember when the Phoenicians, or sorry, Pharisees called Yahushua the Mashiach, Baal is above, Matith Yahu 10, 25, and claimed that he cast out the demons by the prince of demons, Matith Yahu 12, 24 and 27, Mark 3.22, Luke 11.15.18 and 19. Well, now go to Strong's Greek number 550 or 954 and be ready for a shock. Number 954, Greek Beelzebul of Chaldean origin or Kazdim, meaning Kazdim, Ur of the Kazdim, Babylon, right? They say Chaldean because the Chaldonians are the most hated people by Rome. They were a thorn in their side for over a thousand years. But it says, of Kazdim origin, by parody upon 1176, Dung, Mighty One, or the, 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 the poop deity. Baalzebul, the name of Satan, a name of Satan, Baalzebub, right? And that's the gist of it. It's a title for Satan, and it's known. Gad, God, God. Are you beginning to see that Baal, Lord, or Lord, or Master, is that Baal, or and that Baal is none other than Satan himself? But coupled with Satan's titles of Baal, which equals Lord or Lord or Lord or Master, is the word Gad. Gad meant fortune or that troop. Could the old saying about a person selling their soul to Satan have any bearing here? Satan will give you a fortune for your soul, but once you have sold it to him, he will usually double-cross you and take your life or soul away. How many troops of lost souls does Satan have through his deceptions? Now, or notice how the Mazerites vowel pointed the word Gad in Hebrew 
1409 like this. And that is a gimel with a comet and then a dalit, which closes the symbol, syllable rather. And when you have a comet with a closed syllable, it is called a comet's hot tooth. And a comet normally makes the ah sound like a h. But when you have a comet's hot tooth, it makes an o. The reason why they do that with the vowels is is peculiar and they explain it for their system. I'm not trying to argue or anything. I'm just pointing out the facts that that is a G O D sound. And you can find that proof of it when you look at the word like hokma. You have the haith with the comets hatuf, and then it's closed with the cough, and then the mem he. So hok ma in the very same way that you have god right here or g-a-w-d <clears throat> it says when pointed like this the word is pronounced god or god or god in hebrew now if we translate the al gad into english what does it become does it not become lord god or lord god or lord god the capitalization doesn't change the sound of the word in any way and even so, the fact is, Baal Gad is the Lord God, who is Lord Satan or Master Satan. And this gentleman doesn't make the connection that the literally Gimel, Dalit, Resh, Aleph, Lamed, or God Riel is the name of Satan as exposed in the book of Hanok. He's the one who deceived Hua or Eve in the garden. Putting it together. Let me quote another explanatory note from pages 1214, 1215 of the scriptures. Gad, apart from Gad, the son of Yaakov, there was another Gad. The astrologers of Babel called Jupiter, or Jupiter, rather, Zeus, which Jupiter is the Latin name Zeus is the greek name gad or god is the babylonian or hebrew the semitic name for satan but it's all the same one this is what he's trying to point out the astrologers of babel called jupiter zeus by the name of god he was also well known among the canaanite the canaanites where his name was often coupled with baal the Al Gad, which according to the Maserite, Maseratic vowel pointing in the book of Yahushua, is pronounced Baal God, is the same, or sorry, this same name is discovered in the ancient Germanic languages as Gut, which that G and T, the reason why it's Gut instead of God, if you remember, just to recap, and again, this is something that you'll find if you read this dissertation there was two major sh sound shifts in the hebrew language for the germanic speaking hebrews that went off the northern kingdom taken into dispersion split up and went east and west generally while heading north the ones who went to the west first or predominantly spoke the gaelic or celtic languages it was also added mixed into the ancient greek and into the ancient Latin, which helped those languages become what they were. But those are mixtures of Hebrews with the sons of Yahweh, or Yepheth, which was Yahweh and Ketim specifically. Back on point, though, the northern kingdom going into dispersion, when they went generally west, they spoke Gaelic or Celtic Celtic languages. And the structure or function of the language with its suffixes and prefixes and the way that the words formed and the, how the sentences went together generally stayed the same. But the vowel sounds or the words changed. The way it sounded went different a little bit. You can still follow it along as it goes. The more you go down time and away the, or the different areas, the more influence it has with others, it changes. But back on point. The ones that went east is what we call the Germanic language shifts. 
you had the first one about 500 BC or roughly 200 and so years after the my the dispersion where the language locked in place they lost the use of the suffixes and prefixes and the begad kathath letters or the letters in hebrew that change based on usage locked into place so you didn't have the shift in the sounds anymore it was all settled and then that shift happened one more time in the what's called the high german sound shift or what created what we call the yiddish language when the Yahudim that were taken out of the land of Palestine from after the Babylonian captivity. Emperor Hadrian in 130 kicked them out of the land because of the Bar Kova revolt. And they were cast into dispersion. A group of them went into Europe. And when they went there and mixed with the already Hebrew, broken Hebrew German speaking people there, which spoke low, low German. They caused the high German sound shift where the sounds of the vowels and the words that they brought from Babylon, like the T and the S, the Tau making an S sound, or Ds and Ss and interchanging these, those shifts happened at that point. And that's why you have the different vowels and the different sounds or letters for different words, but they're all related. And that's where you get the differences between English and German and German and Dutch and the other Scandinavians and those with the Celtic. So just trying to help tie that back in. It can be really confusing, but as you learn about the migrations, as you learn about the individual ways they all went into error or they all migrated and shifted, then you can see how the language was starting to shift and change with them as it went on. And all of that was foretold by Tay Taffy in the book of Tay Taffy or in the Irish bard songs that were collected about what she had said and done. And then you can also see about the, the renewed language or the language of creation being given and having one lip again, both in the book of Gad the Seer and Zeph and Yahu. If I remember correctly, it's Zeph and Yahu and not Zakar Yahu. But real quick, it says putting it together. It says, let me quote another explanatory note from pages 12, 14, 12, 15 of the scriptures. <clears throat> Gad, apart from Gad, the son of Jacob, there was another Gad. So apart from the one of the sons of Jacob, there was another. The astrologers of Babel called Jupiter Zeus by the name of Gad or God. He was also well known among the Canaanim or the Canaanites, where his name was often coupled with Baal. Baal Gad, which according to the Masoretic vowel pointing in the book of Yahushua, is pronounced Baal God. The same name is discovered in the ancient Germanic languages as Got, Goda, Gud, God, Gud, Gade. And again, you can see the Gimel Dalet is there, but the vowels fluctuate. And searching further back into its Indo-Germanic or Indo-European roots, we find that it traces back to the word Goda, which means union, even sexual union. No wonder this meaning is still evident in the Dutch and German Gode. It is also not difficult to see it in the English gadfly and gadding about. It is no wonder then that Satan was termed Baal Zebul in Hebrew and Baal or Beel Zebul in Greek. So we have seen that both mean Lord of the Flies. See Brown Driver and Briggs Hebrew lexicon of the Old Testament under 1160 or 1176. How ironic that Satan was pictured as a gadfly or as one who gads about. A look at the definition of these two words in Webster's New World Dictionary is quite revealing. Gadfly, noun, plural flies. Gad plus fly. One, a large fly that bites livestock. So that bites the cattle. Okay. Two, one who annoys others. Gad about, noun, a person who gads about restless seeker after fun, etc. Gad, Hebrew gada, literally fortune. 
one or the seventh son of Yaakov, two, the tribe of Yisrael descending from him. And Gad, it's a euphemism for God, a mild oath or expression of surprise, disgust, etc. So a euphemism for deity is what it means. And that's still used in that very same means today, but they say as, as a blasphemy. And the only reason why I call it a blasphemy instead of, you know, an ignorant sin and error, they're just cursing Satan, which in the odes of Shalomo, I believe it's mentioned, but it says, or it might be the epistle of Barnabas, one of these, I have to double check, but it mentions explicitly when sinners curse Satan, they curse their own soul or their own Ruach because he's the one that's leading them. And when they use that euphemism, they're literally doing that. However, Kepha explains that when people blaspheme the title of Elohim, it's in truth, blaspheming the name of the creator because they use that title in substitution for him. And while people might not know that this is not his title nor his name, they use it in reference to him, and thus it is attributed that sin because they do that intentionally. So I would never recommend anyone doing that kind of thing. This is Gad, Gaded, Gadin, Gadin, to hurry perhaps back formation, gadling, companion in arms, or companion in fighting and going about as a reckless seeker after fun, restless seeker after fun, rather, right? But it says, gadlin, i.e. base for gather, to wander about in an idle or restless way, as in seeking amusement. Noun, an active gadding chiefly in the phrase or on or upon the gad, gadding about, gadder, a noun. Now, and those are all a wanderer. You could say uh, wandering to and fro to see whom he may devour, right? As is mentioned in the book of Job. Now let's compare the meanings here with Yeshayahu 65.11, where gad has been translated as that troop. One, a troop is defined as a group or, or a group of persons, animals, or formerly things, herd, flock, band, etc. Two, loosely a great number, lot. Or three, a body of soldiers. A su four, a subdivision of a cavalry regiment that corresponds to a company of infantry. Five, so... This is like a company of infantry, except they are on horses. Okay. Number five, a unit of Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts under an adult leader. And number six, archaic, a group of actors, trope, etc. That's from Webster's New, Dic New World Dictionary. These definitions would cause the meaning of this word to fall in the category of Gad one in the sense of gather, which is why the translators rendered Gad as that troop. Gad, one, corresponds with the meaning of the deity of fortune, which also was Yahuwah's intended purpose for using the word, while Gad, two, ties it all together in the sense of a euphemism for Elohim. In the book of Yob, When Satan appeared with the sons of Elohim before Yahuwah, he asked, or he was asked, Whence comest thou? Satan's answer was, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Job 1 7 2 2. Satan as Baal Zebub, or Lord of Flies, does exactly what a gadfly and a gadabout does. He is a restless seeker after fun. He goes to and fro, up and down, seeking to annoy others, especially man, but also Yahuwah, which he thinks is fun. Satan does have a terrible bite, and he can be very annoying too, just like a gadfly. Also, he gads about looking for souls to devour, and it must be a lot of fun for him to deceive and cause so much misery 
and suffering upon mankind. Job chapters 1 and 2 again, 1st Kepha 5 verse 8. No wonder James Strong said that Beelzebul was a name for Satan. Strong's number 954, Greek dictionary. So what have we learned from our study of a few scriptures using the inspired Hebrew language and a few Greek words? We have learned that Elohim, or that God was originally the name of an idol once worshipped in Babel or Babylon. It was later spread throughout the land of Canaan, being picked up by the Canaanim and adopted by the children of Israel when they went into apostasy. We ha also have learned from Yeshayahu 65, 11, and 12, the shocking truth that many of Yahuwah's people have been tricked into forsaking Yahuwah for this pagan idol by Satan playing word games. Yirmiyahu 2, 10 through 13. The saddest part of all is that behind this pagan idol called Baal Gad, or Lord God, stands the real being who is worshipped by the whole Christian world, Satan himself. Yeshayahu 14, 12 through 17, Yehezkiel or Ezekiel 28, 1 through 9, Second Timothy, or sorry, Second Thessalonians 2, 3 through 12. Yes, Christians are awaiting a final Antichrist to come, which is delusion in itself, okay? To begin with, being termed Catholic Christians <clears throat> was coined by Sixtus the Third, the 666 that was foretold of Revelation, who helped put together the Theodosius Codex, or the rules and laws that were going to be in that, in three... 28 or, or AD or 332 AD I'm sorry and that's when he was anointed or made the overseer the bishop of Rome and given the name Sixtus the third he was the 44th bishop of the Roman assembly he was not not all of them were anti-Christ or anti-Mashiach but he's the one that was foretold who brought about the desolation the abomination that desolates which was foretold in the Maccabees with Antiochus Epiphans, which was setting up the statue of Zeus in the temple of Elohim and slaughtering the pig on the altar. In a spiritual sense, you know what Zeus represents here was Satan. And the pig in Latin is Jesus, or the earth pig. You can't make that up. The, the Zeus, the, the horse in Hebrew, is the pig in Latin. And that was what was offered by Sixtus on the altar of the heart of men that people abominate themselves by believing. That in keeping Christmas and these other feast days that are not the feast days that are in scripture. So this future Antichrist or this future anti-Mashiach and all that estecology is Jesuit theology to deceive people. <clears throat> But it says, yes, Christians are awaiting a final Antichrist to come, but do not realize he is already in their midst and worshiped, which is the, the office of the Bishop of Rome today. Christians are preparing a feast table for God, Satan, and they don't even know it and wouldn't believe it even if it were told them. Christians just don't realize who stands behind the idol and its name to receive its praise and worship. Please see Leviticus 17.7 or Waikra, which and he called Deuteronomy 32.17 or Devarim, Psalm 106 or Tehillim 106.37, Second Chronicles 11.15 and First Corinthians 10.21. And 22. But all Gad is the Lord God of the Christians, but don't try to tell them. I told you so because they wouldn't believe it, even if you showed it to them straight out of the Hebrew scriptures. 
And this was what the condemnation of what Shaul or Paul was giving to these people, the Yahudim, when he was preaching to them. And don't let it be said of you that you, you, know, you wouldn't even believe if it was told to you that it happens. And it was foretold, I believe, in Yahu, right? But they have eyes but can't see and ears and can't hear. They're blind and deaf because of spiritual idolatry. Psalm 115, Psalm 135, Chokma Shalomo, the epistle of Yirmiyahu attached to the letter of Baruch. It's literally all over the place. Idolatry, the worship of idols, both in a literal sense and a spiritual sense, leads to blindness. Kepha makes it even more clear in the recognitions of Clement, where he says that Yahuwa Yahushua, or he says Yahushua is in the minds of all men. And being a foreteller, he knows what's in the mind of everyone. And those who have prepared their minds for him, he makes himself known to them. But those that are perverted, he is as if he doesn't exist in there. This is, but if you are a Christian and you see the truth herein presented, what should you do about it? The scriptures have the answer. Truly then, having overlooked these times of ignorance, Yahuwah now commands all men everywhere to repent. And that's what we all have to do, both of our sins and the sins of our fathers. Come and let us turn back to Yahuwah, for he has torn, but he does heal us. He has stricken, but he binds us up. After two days, he shall revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up so that we may live before him. So let us know, let us pursue to know Yahuwah. For his going forth is as certain as the dawn or bokeh. And he comes to us like the rain, like the latter rain watering the earth. Now, just for the benefit of everyone here, it, it's like in after two days, he will revive us, which is what we're going through right now. The revival of the truth in the, word, in the world after the two days of his death, which is foretold in what he walked out in the feasts. It's all over in the parables here and then on the third day he will raise us up so that we may live before him which is what's going to be happening what we're in the process of leading towards and the culmination of the millennial reign and this is what we have to do let us know him let's pursue to know him for his going forth is as certain as the dawn it says in the foretellers for the coming of our mashiach it mentions it as, as lightning comes from the east, even unto the west, so shall the coming of the son of Adam be. But lightning doesn't strike from the east to the west. The sun, however, comes from the east to the west, and that's how the dawn appears. The perfect light of dawn is what the righteous are on their path working towards, it mentions in the Proverbs. And these are all tying together with the light of truth, who is our Mashiach, being pursued by those who are desiring to know Yahuwah, okay? And then it says, and he comes to us like rain, like the latter rain mentioned by Yaakov, watering the earth. The rain is his instructions, his ordinances and commands that he mentions in Deuteronomy 32, the song of Yahuwah. So tying that in together as well. You also see him coming down like rain in Psalm 72, I believe, which is the song of to Shalomo about giving your righteousness to the son of the king, which is our Mashiach. But continuing here, it says, Yisrael, return to Yahuwah, your Elohim, for you have stumbled by your inequity. Inequity is different from sin and transgression because it's what you know to be wrong that you intentionally do. And the children... We're given the commands not to call on others and intentionally went otherwise. So it was inequity to us or to our fathers. Take words with you and return to Yahuwah. Say to him, take away all inequity and accept what is good. And we will render the bowls of our lips. Asher or 
the proud, another title for that false mighty one. Asher does not save us. We do not ride on horses, nor ever again do we say to the works of our hands, our mighty ones, for the fatherless finds compassion in you. And he's a father to the fatherless, meaning the people who are now forsaken that turn to him, right? Here's another. And Yahuwah says in response to our repentance, I shall hear the, heal their backsliding. I shall love them spontaneously, for thy displeasure has turned away from him. I shall be like the dew to Yisrael, like the commands coming up from the ground, the waters, right? He shall blossom like the lily and cast out his roots like Lebanon. The difference in the waters, just so you can see the picture in the parable, the, the latter rain or the rains come from above, the dew comes from the earth. But it is his commands that are being talked about in the illusion of water, who is the fountain of life or the water of life is our Mashiach, who is the word, who is the Torah, which is the commandments or the common law. It all is synonymous. And this is what it is meaning by these things here. So, Ab willing, it's easy to see. I'm just pointing it out in case someone might have not known that. But it says, I shall be like the dew to Yisrael. He shall blossom like the lily and cast out his roots like Lebanon. His branches shall spread and his splendor shall be like an olive tree and his fragrance like Lebanon. Those who dwell under his shadow shall return. They shall revive like grain and blossom like the vine and become as fragrant as the wine of Lebanon. What more had Ephraim to do with idols? And Ephraim is specifically, it's an, an allusion to the northern kingdom, but specifically in foretelling it would be Great Britain and the Meloha Goyim, or the fullness of the nations that came in, which the veil would be over their eyes until the Meloha Goyim, the fullness of the nations. That was the culmination of the British Empire where everyone that was not divvied up into a tribe in foretelling what the British Empire took over was the fullness of Ephraim in foretelling and for foretelling purposes. So when you read Ephraim, you're reading the Commonwealth of Britain, generally. And the Northern Kingdom, Yisrael, in allusion. This kind of parallel is made very evident if you read the book I can't remember the gentleman who wrote it, but it's called Yahuda's Scepter and Yahusuf's Birthright or Judah's Scepter and Joseph's Birthright. It was written in 1901, but I'll find that again. To continue, it says, It is I who answer and look after him. I am like a green cypress tree. Your fruit comes from me. Who is wise, let him comprehend these things. Who is prudent? Let him know them. For the ways of Yahuwah are straight or right. The righteous walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. Another one here says, As the emissary Kepha cried out, Repent and be immersed, every one of you, in the name of Yahushua the Mashiach, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Kodesh Ruach, or set apart Ruach. In another place, he reveals that the name of the Mashiach is the only name under Shemaim whereby we must be delivered. It is the admonition of this ministry, the gentleman who wrote the article, that we repent of our sins and fulfill the criteria revealed in Acts 2.38 and 4.12. May Yahuwah Barak you to see, hear, and comprehend these things, and may you be led Sorry, and may you be led to fulfill them in your life. And I say, Amen. I desire that for myself and everyone too, that we hear the truth and confirm it and conform ourselves to it. So, real quick here, editor's note just because, and this is the editor from the website, 
So just because one uses the correct name of the Heavenly Father and His Son, that does not necessarily mean that they are any better than Christians who have yet to be enlightened to the truth presented in this article. We all need to work out our own deliverance with fear and trembling. And Jacob James, Jacob makes it clear in his epistle, if you are to keep the entirety of the Torah, but you sin in one, you've sinned in all. Because there is no exception. Sin leads to death. And we have to remove that from us if we want to be in life. When our Mashiach returns, those that are his will be brought up with him to be with him where he is. But those will never taste death physically. And only certain people will fit that criteria. You can't be in any known sin to do so. Any remnant of evil in your body will mean that your body will have to be brought to desolation, as revealed by Kepha. And last one here, it says, Philippians 2.12, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my present o- or presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own deliverance with fear and trembling. For it is Yahuwah that which works in you both to will and to do his total pleasure. Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and harmless. The sons of Yahuwah, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. And then there is just one more thing I'd like to mention with all of this stuff together. I don't know if I have it actually out. I have to put it here. I don't know if this will work, so I'm I'm apologizing. Yeah, you can't see it very well. Right here, I don't know how to make that bigger. But right here, here's a quote just for the context of his no longer being called Baal for us. And this one is found in, I'm going to read it from right here. It's found in Hosea 2, verse 16 through 20. It says, Therefore see, I am alluring her, and shall lead her into the wilderness. And I put America here. If you're familiar, it mentions the dove going into the wilderness, or fleeing the bird fleeing to the mountain, his children being in the wilderness, away from the perverted, to keep his law where they can't keep it with them. That was culminated in America. You can find it in the anti-Mashiach or Antichrist for Dummies videos very clearly. Uh, Columbia, which was the original name of our country, Hail Columbia was the original national anthem, is the woman who fled on eagle's wings to the wilderness, which is America. And it was called the greater wilderness by the pilgrims or the that came here. But the illusion of the dove, which Columbus, Columbus or Columbia is the city of the dove, which is the district of Columbia, the district of the city of the dove, all tying in with what you can find in Revelation about this and in the stars themselves. So I have no qualms. I'm absolutely 100% no for certain as fact and reality. The wilderness here is mentioned as America. And as we go along, you'll see more of that. There's a foretellings in Yirmiyahu talking about when the after the Puritans come to America, then Britain would repent and the two would be working hand in hand to help Yahu to go back to the land. It says it right there. I think it's Yirmiyahu 31. But most of us, because we don't realize what's being spoken of in parables there, have no idea that those foretellings were literally accomplished already. And they're amazing. But let me read this real quick. It says, therefore, I am alluring her and shall lead her into the wilderness and shall speak to her heart and give to her vineyards from there, meaning the places from which to be rooted and bear fruit. And the valley of Achor as a door of expectation. Achor, or the valley of Achor, was created, and you find it in Yahushua or Joshua chapter 7 and 8, 
But the door that he sets before his people that is open, that will not be shut, is this door of expectation or door of hope, which is in, in represented in the Valley of Achor for those of us here in the wilderness or generally the world in this time after the uh, Dark Ages and the escape from Europe by the Puritans and the others in leaving Europe to come to America to escape to the wilderness. Back on point, the Achan was a son of Zerok of the tribe of Yehuda, if I remember correctly. After the fall of Jericho, he had taken something that was under the ban, an accursed garment of Babylon, if I remember, and some idols or some money and stuff that was supposed to be burned in fire. He hid it in the ground in his tent, and because he had taken what was under the ban, the entirety of the children were now under the curse of the covenant, and they could not stand before their, their enemies at I. Those, everyone who was in sin, in any minute version of sin, was now open to death, and some men ended up dying. They were sinning in ignorance, not openly against their maker, but because of Achan's intentional inequity, the protection of our creator was no longer over the people, and they suffered defeat. When that was brought to his attention, Yahushua fell, tore his garments, and petitioned Yahuwah, cried, and was told, get up, what are you doing laying down there? Your people are suffering because they're cursed. Someone took what was under the ban, they can't stand before their enemies. You're going to have to fix it before we can move on. Of which he announced to the people that thing, and then gave them an opportunity to bring it forward of their own, of which no one did. And the next day they cast lots until the one who was chosen brought it forth and told to confess, acknowledges what he did. And then he was taken, all of his house, and all that he owned, taken outside the camp, stoned with stones, buried, and killed. Uh, it was a point to say, this is what's going to happen, and this is what's required before he will allow us to have victory against our enemies again and conquer in the land, which is what was required before they could continue and have victory. So that is the door of expectation before believers today in this country and the world. That if we will separate from the impure, if we will put what is under the ban away from us and cast stones at it, meaning the rock of his word, we don't kill people today. But if we do that, we can be successful and stand against our enemies and have united, be united under Yahushua as he brings us back in victory and continuing what we're supposed to do. So check this out, though. And he says, and there, meaning the wilderness, she shall respond as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Mitzrayim, meaning they kept the feasts and were delivered and brought into the land, right? But there was the 40 years wilderness journey that they went through first, which is what our time in America is all about, if you're starting to get the picture. And it shall be in that day, declares Yahuwah, that, and this is Yahuwah Mashiach, our Mashiach speaking, because he is the bridegroom, and he is the one who is made a husband unto the bride, as mentioned by Shaul. But it says, and it shall be in that day, declares Yahuwah, that you call me my husband, but that's literally Ishi, Aleph, Yod, Shin, Yod, which is my man, not husband, but man because he came as a man and our country from its inception stood on the foundation of our Mashiach, even though they called him by the wrong name at the time. They literally knew he was the man that came for them in that day. He says, in that day, you shall call me my man and no longer call me my Lord or Baali. And I shall remove the names of the Baalim or the Lords from her mouth and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And that should be, and they, or that I, right? And in that day, I shall make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, and with the birds of the Shemaim, and with the creeping creatures of the ground. When bow and sword in battle, I break from the earth, and I shall make them lie down in safety. Now, this could be alluding to the buddings of the millennial reign when he 
actually comes and subdues these enemies and then reigns for a thousand years or it could be after the millennial reign when after satan was released for a time and there's literally going to be no more fighting ever again and then it says and i shall take you as a bride unto me forever and take you as a bride unto me in righteousness and in right ruling and in loving kindness and compassion and i shall take you as a bride unto me in trustworthiness and you shall know yahuwah which is our mashiach who's going to be the husband of the bride there as the father is not the bridegroom but allusions to that are also found in revelation and other places which we had shared in the telegram but not not there so that was it for today uh, i appreciate your time and father willing through our through our mashiach yahuwah yahushua you all can see why in this fellowship and for everyone that we talk to we share these things and why we believe it's very important that the titles and names we use in regard to the almighty and his son be correct so thank you all for your time shabbat shalom shavua tov and we'll see you next time i don't know if there's anything hallelujah hallelujah